Oh, the warmth and the friendliness of the people. It's outrageous. I tell you, I keep coming to absorb it. It's a great place to be. I'm Ginny, and I'm all in. for a church home in the Hamilton area and I've always been a, an admirer of, of Joel Osteen so I went onto his website to look for local churches in the area and Hope Cathedral is one of the churches um, that I saw so I attended Hope and instantly from walking into the door just the welcome and the warmth that I felt I knew that this is the place that I wanted to continue to to worship hi my name is Dawn Brown and I'm all in We're actually in the fifth part of this series that we have entitled, I'm All In. And we're using this series as a chance and an opportunity for us to really focus on what God has called us to do as a church and how we can accomplish it by promoting the vision, by staying faithful to the vision, by living a lifestyle of love and service and generosity towards other people. And with all of the things we've been talking about, one of the key ingredients to making vision happen is the people component. That there is a responsibility and a part that each of us has to play in God's plans coming to pass in the earth. So let me start with this statement. You matter to God. Now, I really thought I'd get a better response than that. Because I believe the reason why many people did not respond positively is because you don't feel that in the larger scheme of things, your role really matters. But it actually does. If we would stop disqualifying ourselves and stop saying how we're not able to be used by God, and recognize that God knows our faults, God knows our failings, and in spite of all of that, before we even showed up on earth, God had a purpose for our lives. So look at this, your purpose came before your mistakes. So if your purpose came before your mistakes, then your mistakes cannot wipe out your purpose. So let me say this phrase again. You matter to God. Amen. That's a little bit better. That's a little better. A little better. But the moment that we recognize that who we are and all we've been through has done nothing more than set us up for God to use us for his glory, then we'll recognize that we don't need to be ashamed of our past, we don't need to be ashamed of, our, of where we've been, but we can rest assured that where I am and what God wants to do in my life is secured in spite of how many times I've fallen down. And what I want to talk about today is simply how we as people, imperfect, broken people, can be used by God to do extraordinary things. So let me, let's me let start off with our first point here. Fill in the blank on your note sheet. God's plans are fulfilled through people. Whenever you read the Bible, you notice that there's a human component in everything that happens. Remember when Israel was in Egypt and they were in slavery and the people of Israel cried out to God and said, God, please set us free. God had the power, because he is God, to set them free by just snapping his fingers. Because after all, he's God, right? But what God does is he calls Moses and says, hey, Moses, I'm sending you to set my people free. In fact, when God calls Moses, it's so wonderful because Moses is standing before God. He's seen the burning bush and Moses is, is in awe of all that God is doing with that bush that's burning, but it's not consumed. And while he's there, and God starts to say, Moses, my people have cried out to me. 
They've been crying out for freedom. They've been crying out because they've been mistreated. And Moses is like, yes, I was there. I know how badly they were treated. Moses, I I see that my people are being hurt and they're being kept captive and they're not being able to fulfill their potential. And Moses is like, yes, 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 they are. Yeah, I saw it. I was a part of it. I know the people are struggling, God. And and then God says, and Moses, I want to set my people free. Moses is like, yes, God, set them free. You ought to set them free. And then God says, and Moses, I'm using you to do it. Wait, huh? Hold up. They're your people. They cried out to you for help. So why in the world are you sending me? After all, I really don't speak well. But God was establishing that if you're just willing to say yes to him, he'll make you sufficient enough to get the job done. You know, Paul in the New Testament wrote the majority of the New Testament. Before God called him, he killed Christians. He had so much anger against Christians that he went to the, to the high council and got permission, got warrants to be able, every time he found a Christian, to persecute them and to kill them. He is the last person that I would choose to be on my team to promote Christianity. But God saw something in him. And God took broken Saul and made him preacher Paul. God takes us ordinary people to fulfill his plan in the earth. And just like God used Moses, just like God used David, just like God used all the prophets, just like God used Paul. God wants to use each and every one of us. And in this master plan that God has, the weakest part of his plan is us. (laughs) Because sometimes we feel like doing God's work And other times, I just need a break. And every time we take a break on God, we're actually saying, God, hey, I know you have a master plan to touch the world and change and transform people's lives, but put it on hold for a little while because I need a break. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that the person who shared Jesus with me didn't take a break because I don't know where I'd be if they didn't do their part in showing me the way to Jesus Christ. And so even when Jesus came on this earth and he was ready to do ministry, his first act was to call people to be with him so they could touch the world together. And so Matthew chapter 4, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Now let me say this to you. Fishermen were not considered upper echelon people. Fishermen were dirty, rough around the edges. They really were were, were, were real tough kind of people. But when Jesus wanted to get a group of people together that he was going to use to change the world, He went to an unlikely place, some fishermen who were cleaning their dirty nets, and said, hey, come and follow me. You won't fish for fish anymore. I'll teach you how to be a fisher of men. And from that point forward, he called his disciples to come alongside of him. And the Bible says immediately they followed him, leaving the boat and even their father behind. When Jesus called them, they said, Lord, if if this is what you want me to do, I'm all in. Not only does God's, are God's plans fulfilled through people, God invites you to partner with him. God's never going to force us to work for him. He respects the free will that he's given us. And so as much as God has a plan and a purpose for us, 
to touch other people's lives. He will never force us. What he does is he simply invites us. And here's how he invites us. He says, look at all I've done for you. Look at how I've been there for you. Look at how I've answered your prayers. Look at how I've lifted you when you've fallen. In light of all of the things I've done for you, will you turn around and do something for someone else? In light of how I've loved you in spite of you, will you love others in spite of their actions? God says, I'm never going to make you do anything But what I am going to do is simply remind you of all that I've done for you in the hopes that that will become a motivator for you to say, God, if you're that good to me, how can I say no to you? You know, we just came out of this season of Thanksgiving, and I pray that Thanksgiving for you will not just be a day anymore, but it will be a really a daily lifestyle that every day you awaken with a sense of gratitude for how good God has been been to you. We did uh, something around our our Thanksgiving table this year where we asked every person just to go around and say what they were thankful for. And as I was preparing for it, I just began to think through all the things that God has done just this year. And I, I, I was amazed because a lot of the things I'd actually forgotten. But when I looked back and saw how God came through, even in some areas that I didn't even think he was gonna come through in, my heart was so full of gratitude. And my response to God's goodness is, God, I'm going to be even more committed to you than I was before. Because I recognize how good you've been to me. You know, listen, you're here about to go into the last month of this year. And for some of you, the early part of this year, you didn't know where you would be this time of year. But you're here. God has kept you. God has brought you through some insurmountable odds. And all God says is, if if I have been there for you, will you be there for me in helping to touch somebody else? He invites us. Here's how Paul says it. I love it. Paul says, as God's partners. Isn't that amazing? We're partners with God. I mean, see a sign over a door that, that, that is because I'm a partner with God. That, that sign says God and Gross Incorporated. That's pretty powerful. God says, you're my partner. We're in this thing together. I can't fulfill my purposes without you, and you can't fulfill your purpose without me. We're partners together. That's pretty powerful. That's why you have to understand that you matter to God. Because you're not even a junior partner. You're not an associate. You are a full-fledged partner with God to change this world. So Paul says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness, and then ignore it. Don't know all that God has done for you and say, so what? No, be reminded of all that God has done for you and then say, God, in light of your goodness, I'm going to not only receive what you've done for me, but I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. In the way you've touched my life, I want to see you touch somebody else's life. For God says, Paul goes on, at just the right time, I heard you. Has has God answered any of your prayers? (laughs) On the day of salvation, I helped you. Have you ever been in trouble and didn't know how you were going to get out, but God somehow got you out? He says, I've heard your prayers. I've gotten you out of trouble. I've delivered you. I've saved you. I've redeemed you. So in response to all that I've done, indeed, the right time is now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not I'm going to start fresh January. No, in light of how good God has been to me, I'm going to respond now. Today is the day of salvation. 
And so God has a purpose and a plan for my life, and he's inviting me, but he can't do anything until I say yes. And you know what? Because we all have an opportunity to say yes to God, we also have an opportunity to say no to God. And so many of us say no to God, even after he's done such wonderful things. When uh, Quinn and I moved down into this area, we were very clear that God sent us here. And after we started the church, we heard people, people would come to us, say, hey, you, I heard you all started a church here. We said, yep, God sent us all the way from, from western New York to New Jersey so we could, we could start this church. They would say, hey, you know what? Well, God laid on my heart about 10 years ago that I was supposed to start a church. Wow. And we heard that at least three or four times. People came to us after we started this church and said, hey, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago, God said I should start a church in Jackson. But you know what? They never did. I am certain Jackson was not on our original life plan. In fact, two places we did not want to live were New Jersey and New York. But literally, when we moved into this area and we were driving on 195 West coming to Jackson for the first time, the moment we crossed over the Jackson town line, that sign is still there, the moment we crossed over that line, it was like a sense of peace came over Quinn and I, and we said, this is where we're supposed to be. And God has shown himself over the last uh, 14 years we've been here, but 12 years since this church, that he sent us to the right place. All God's looking for is somebody who will just say yes to him. But in so much as we have the power to say yes, we also have the power to say no. And when we say no, we forfeit our spot and require God to raise up somebody else to take our place. And you know what? When they take our place, they also take our reward. I don't know about you. I don't want anybody to take what God has set aside for me. I've lost enough. I've forfeit enough in life. I'm not losing anything else. So if God is inviting me to partner with him to change the world, my response is bring it on. And so in order for us to change the world, how God does that is God plants us in a local church. Now, I believe firmly the local church is the hope of the world. With all that's happening in this country, in this world, what's going to make a difference is not politicians. Hear me. What's going to make a difference is not community organizing. What's going to make a difference is that there are life-giving churches that exist in local communities that preach a message of hope and love and then challenge people to go and take the message of love and hope out into the community, out into the workplace, and that's when we're going to see real, lasting change. It will not come from Washington, D.C. It must come from the local church. It will not come from Trenton. It must come from the local church because the local church is God's institution in the community to make a difference. So God plants us in local churches. And I know for many of us, we we, we don't like to be committed to things. We like to be a free agent. We don't want to be tied down. But listen, the Bible says those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they'll flourish. If you're not planted, you'll never flourish. So we need to be connected. So God sent you to this local church, not just that you can come and have a good worship experience, no, but so that you can actually roll up your sleeves and say, God, use me to help change the world. And so when Paul is talking about the church and how we're supposed to operate, he likens us to a physical body. In fact, he calls us the body of Christ. And he says each of us have different functions that we're supposed to play uh, in the body. But here's the key point he makes. Look there at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, God has put each part just where he wants it. So you're here not just because you like it. You're here Because this is where God wants you to be, because he knows that there's something he wants you to do here that's going to change the world. Are you all hearing me? 
So who is God calling? Who is God calling? Four characteristics of the people that God is calling, and I believe this is going to challenge all of us as we look at how we can be more effective and more useful to God's plan. The first is God is calling people who value love over criticism. Man, if you watch the news for any period of time, you see that there are no shortage of critics. Everybody wants to critique something. But the sad thing is that same critical spirit has come over into the family of God. And we now think that we have the spiritual gift of pickiness. Where it's our spiritually ordained responsibility to always point out something that's not right. If you have a critical spirit, it actually is a sign that something's broken on the inside. Because if you can only see negative, you can see a million good things, but for some reason you're drawn to that one bad thing. You got to check your own heart. Because that means something is going on on the inside of you. I mean, every time you look at something or someone, you always find out what's wrong. That critical spirit is a sign that there's brokenness inside. Here's how the Bible says it. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, all things are defiled. So if everything you do is about judging people and criticizing people and telling people how they're not good enough, how they're not living up to whatever standard you think they ought to be living up to, you're wrong. And I say that with all due respect. God called us to love people. God called us to love people. We, we're just supposed to love people. And if you just live your life loving people, you actually live freer. If you have to constantly keep reminding yourself, I'm supposed to be mad at them because they didn't pay me back that $25 that they borrowed from me 30 years ago. I'm not supposed to speak to her because she did, wasn't there when I called her and I was in trouble 15 years ago. And I, I know I'm not talking to him because I, he, he knows full well what he did. And I, I, I may not remember what, I, what he did, but I know he remembers what he did. But I know I'm not supposed to talk to him, so I'm not going to talk to him. Do you know how much work that takes? Some of y'all sat around Thanksgiving tables and you sat there trying to think, now what am I supposed to be mad at them about? <laughs> Let that stuff go. Just love people. If they did you wrong, love them and keep on going. It doesn't matter. Don't lend them any more money, but still love them. <laughs> but it keeps your heart pure. God's calling us to be people who love. God's calling us to see brokenness, to see messed up situations, and not put on a, a robe of judgment, but put on gloves of love and touch them and help them and bring them to a level of peace and wholeness that he desires. Wholeness never comes from criticism and judgment. Wholeness comes from love. Here's what 1 John says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God. For, come on, say it with me, God is love. I can't say I'm a Christian and I'm always tearing people down. No, I'm, I can't say I'm a Christian. I'm always talking about people. No. All I'm supposed to do is be like Jesus and love people. Jesus saw people sinning, and he didn't unload on them. He lovingly pointed them in the right direction. That woman uh, who was caught in adultery, Jesus didn't condemn her and say, you, you're, you're, and call her a bunch of names. No. He said, no, go and sin no more. The harlot who was brought to him, caught in the very act of adultery. Everybody wanted to accuse her. But Jesus said, I don't accuse you. Go and do the right thing. God wants us to love people through their weakness. 
I'm not talking about we, 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 we uh, affirm weakness or we affirm sin. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is what's going to change a person from a life of sin to a life of God is love. You can beat a person down all day long. That's not going to draw them closer to God. That's actually going to push them further away from God. And so 1 Timothy tells us, be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. That's all God wants us to be, is just be an example. Rather than criticizing them, just be an example. Point number two. God wants people who value unity over pride. May I submit to you that all of us have different ways of doing things. And it doesn't mean that because something's being done one way, it's the, it's the best way or the right way. It just means it's the way. But if we get caught up in a tug of war around, well, I think the ushers ought to do this. I think the, the greeters ought to do this. Well, I think, well, I think, well, I think. Then you've put pride over unity. Because all of us come into a situation and a scenario where leadership is established and direction is, 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 is already set. And so our role is to get a part of it and start going with it. And as we see things that can be bettered, then lovingly we share our ideas for, to see how we can now make things better. But if we all want to be in a, well, I think it ought to be done this way. Well, I think, well, I think, well, I, well, we all could do that and we would get absolutely nowhere. Couples today are stalled and stymied in their relationship because the husband says he wants it his way and the wife says she wants it her way and they never come into agreement. They never come into unity and so they stay stuck. I'm so grateful that this church has never gotten stuck. We've recognized that we're gonna, one thing we're not going to compromise is our desire to win the lost. How we win them will change. That's why we're a church that doesn't mind changing what we do. We change simply because we want to be agile enough to always reach one more for Jesus. And I don't, I don't ever want to be a part of a church whose mantra is, we've always done it that way before. So Paul said to the church in Philippi, he tells them, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Point number three, God is looking for people who value obedience over convenience. Obedience seems like such a foreboding word. Obey, obedience. But obedience is actually how we show God that we love him. So we can, in our worship time, we can lift our hands and we say, oh God, I love you. We can say those words, but those words mean nothing if when God witnesses to our heart to go take someone a meal or go visit someone in the hospital or go have lunch with someone and we say, I'm too busy to do that. You've actually shown God that you don't really love him because you won't obey him. And so the way we show God that we love him is through our obedience to what he tells us to do. Having a purpose without obedience is like getting hired for a new job and never showing up. Can you imagine getting an offer letter in the mail? We've given you this job. This is your salary. These are your benefits. This is your starting day. And you get so excited about the letter. I'm, I'm, they hired me. I got a new job. Yes, I got a new job. But you never bother to show up to work. You won't keep that job long, will you? Well, unfortunately, as Christians, that's really what we do. We understand that we have a purpose. We may even go through our growth track and find out what our purpose is. But we never show up to do anything. We never obey God. That's like being hired for a job and yet never showing up. But then going on payday and saying, uh, where's my check? You didn't show up. 
And I wonder spiritually if some of the things that we've been praying for, they haven't happened simply because we haven't shown up. I wonder if we just said, God, I'm going to be as faithful to you as you've been to me. And watch what changes in your life. Why don't you do a little test? Say for the next 90 days, God, I'm going to do everything I can to be faithful to what I believe you're telling me to do and just see what happens in your life. What I believe will happen is you'll start seeing some things in your life that were stuck come unstuck. Some prayers that you've been praying, some things that were making you frustrated and you were wondering, when will this ever change? I believe that as you lock into being faithful and to obeying God, that God's just going to start making some of those things that, that used to be difficult be very easy for you. So God wants us to obey him. Look at what uh, John says. John says, love means doing what God has commanded us. That's what love is. And he has commanded us to love one another just as you heard from the beginning. And let me also tell you that delay, delayed obedience is disobedience too. So David said, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Here's the question Jesus asked his followers that I think ought to convict each and every one of us. Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Isn't that something? We call him our Savior, we call him our Lord, we call him our Master, but yet... When he speaks to our heart to do something to help someone, we say no. And fourthly, and we're done, God wants people who value change over complacency. Do you want to grow? Do you want to be better? Do you really want to look next year and see that you're further ahead than you were this year? All of that requires change. And that change starts from the inside out. And so if we want to see real change, if we want to see God do new things in our lives by this time next year, it will require us taking a stand and saying, I'm no longer going to be complacent, but I'm going to value change. What areas in my life do I need to grow in? Because a person who desires change actually desires God's best for their lives. And a person who desires to stay the same is actually saying, I'm willing to forfeit all the good things that God has for me. Because our blessings and promotions are right on the other side of the change we need to make. And the reason why God wants us to be examples of change is because if people can see that we can change, then it gives them hope that they can change. If people can see that God can help us to be better, to be not as angry, to be not as frustrated, to, to, to give up habits and to be free from things that have kept us bound, if God can do that for us, then that shows somebody else. If he can do it for them, he can do it for me. So your inability to change, your unwillingness to change is actually keeping somebody else stuck in life. And that's where God has to raise up an alternate. And so Paul's admonition is true for us. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so as we close the message today, my simple prayer for you is that you would take your next step in spiritual growth so that God can use you. You may be a regular attender, and God is saying your next step needs to be getting into the growth track. Starting next Sunday, get in the growth track and, and go through the growth track so you can become a partner here and start serving. 
You may have given your life to Christ, but you haven't been water baptized. Your next step ought to be, hey, the next second Sunday, I'm going to get water baptized because I'm taking my next step. Listen, don't worry about all the, all the steps you need to take. Just find out the next step you need to take. For some of you, you're regular in church attendance, but you haven't become a part of a small group. The next time, the, the next small group semester in January, make a commitment, I'm getting in a small group. But I'm going to take the very next step in my own spiritual growth so that I can be more fit for God to use use me because God uses ordinary people. He uses ordinary people just like you and me who are willing to do as he commands. God takes broken people. God took a fatherless boy from East Towson, Maryland and called him to preach the good news of the gospel. And I'm glad about it. God will take divorced people. God will take people from broken homes. God will take abused people. God will take messed up people. And God says, I can use you to bring glory to my name. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> because our little becomes much when we place it in the master's hands. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.